and uh, Kolbrun Haldos Dottir is going to talk from the outside. Kolbrun is not a filmmaker. She comes from art, actually. She has been involved in theater, and uh, as many uh, competent uh, uh, theater persons or artists, uh, at some point they get involved in politics. So you got into politics, you have been in politics for around 10 years, having, uh, sitting at the end of tables, um, dealing with environment and other things. You very often come to the capital of the Nordic countries, which is Copenhagen, uh, to, to attend meetings there. So a warm welcome to you, and you will look at this theme from the outside. Give her a warm hand. Iceland, Kolbrun. Yes, thank you very much. It's really good to be here. I heard so many interesting things uh, here from the podium yesterday. So uh, I consider myself to be one of the uh, viewers, uh, one of the people on the outside with uh, the interest, enough interest to look in. Uh, first, I would like to tell you very briefly about Iceland and Icelandic documentaries. We have an Icelandic film fund. Uh, it's not big. I think it's around 50 million Danish crowns. And uh, this is how the documentaries are treated within the Icelandic Film Fund. 17% uh, of the money go to documentaries, 18%, 17 or 18% to TV projects, and 66% to short films or feature films. So we produced uh, through the Icelandic Film Fund this year 24 documentary projects. 17 in 2012, 15 in 2011. So by the, these numbers, it is quite apparent that the interest for documentaries in Iceland is growing. And I think that is a really good thing. But I would like to narrow my scope uh, in this uh, presentation and talk to the things, talk about the things that are really dear to me, that are really close to my heart, and that is in the environment. I have seen so many films about the environment, and I'm really critical about them. And I ask really uh, difficult questions around most of them. Uh, but uh, what is true, uh, at least, is that uh, Mother Earth is under threat. In Iceland, we know very well about that threat because we have had huge debates in Iceland about aluminium smelters that have been built in Iceland by international corporations like Alcoa. And uh, why do huge companies like Alcoa come to Iceland? It's because of the hydropower. It's because of the waterfalls that we can harness and make electricity from. And huge corporations like Alcoa like to green themselves with uh, energy which they call green. It's made out, made with water. It's not made with uh, the polluting uh, nuclear power or not by burning oil or fossil fuels. But the matter is, of course, not as simple as that. And that's where documentaries come in. Uh, in 1962, a book was published by Rachel Carson the name of that book was Silent Spring. And in my mind, that book changed the course of uh, discussion and debates on everything concerned with the protection of the environment. This book was about pesticides and how pesticides had started already then to threaten uh, the flora and fauna of the Earth. So uh, this, docu this, this book is something that all documentarians that uh, make films about the environment, they read, they have this book somewhere in, in the back of their heads. But uh, 
The problem is that when uh, we start to measure the impacts that uh, the human uh, actions have on the environment, there is, there is, the, the, the scale that we, we measure things on are so difficult for us. They are so difficult because they don't count for Mother Nature. They only count for the environment, no, for the, for the economics, for the economics. Everything is measured on an economic scale. But the economic scales are unjust and they should be replaced by a new scale which is more sensitive to Mother Earth. This is my statement. So when I look at documentaries about the environment, this is my mantra. This is what I keep in mind. The scales that we are measuring things on, and we are so green somehow, we don't question this. We just think that the economical scales are, are, are truth. But are they? If, they were, if the economic scales are just, why does war measure as a positive impact? Is that a just scale? Drilling for oil has positive impact on the economy. Mining for coal and oil, positive impact. Smelting of bauxite, which is the raw material for aluminium production, positive impact on the economics. But does that count for the environment? No, probably not, because if it did, we wouldn't have this global warming thing going on. So, we have colliding interests concerning this issue. We have arguments, pro and con, and we have uh, books being written, hundreds of books, maybe thousands, thousands of articles anyway, that have debated uh, upon these questions whether the man-made actions are responsible for the warming of the planet, for global warming. And uh, this all creates a lot of frustration. And we ask ourselves, what is true and what is false? And then we come to the documentaries and the documentarians. When, we, when I look at documentary films, I ask myself, who made the film? Who are the filmmakers? Are they storytellers? Are they telling me stories? Are they journalists? Are they going really deep into the, into the subjects? Are they artists or scientists? Are they government advocates? And from what governments do they come? Or are they lobbyists? So when I look at a film about the environment, I ask myself these questions. I don't go into deep research all the time, but uh, these are the questions that, go, uh, that, that are, are rolling in my head. And I also ask, who is paying them? Sponsors? Well, who are the sponsors? Advertisers? Who are the advertisers? Big corporations, maybe? Then all my warning signals start to, start to, start to run. Maybe the military is paying. It's quite common that the military gives a lot of money in the USA uh, into making documentaries. And it doesn't say on the credit list. Or the viewers. Maybe the viewers are paying. And then we come to the things that we were talking about yesterday, about crowdfunding, and how the people, how the viewers can pay just by attending the documentary films that are shown in the, in the theaters, in the movie theaters. So we, as, as viewers, are also responsible for going to see the good films, the films that we really want uh, to prosper, we want, we want to see more of. And I also about the mission, ask about the mission of the filmmakers. What are they aiming at? Are they just educating me, or are they trying to indoctrinate me? And this main thing that all documentarians are always working with, you're always, they're always working with uh, the truth. They are going into matters. They, they, they are making a film that, has, that claims to be telling the truth. It claims to be telling the truth. Sometimes it is, 
but sometimes it's not. It's a question about the truth, uh, uh, your point of view. I was talking to a friend of mine who makes documentaries the other day, and I, was, uh, I had just seen the Pussy Riot film, and I liked it very much. And uh, she asked me, but, uh, and I, I, thought, I thought it was so true. I said to her, I thought it was so true. And she asked me, if you were the president of Russia, do you think you would experience it the, the, same, the same way, that it was so true? And I thought, maybe not. So it counts who I am and how I think, how I perceive the films. What is my point of view? What is my education? What is it that I am burning for? One film about the environment that had a really strong message and I experienced as being true was the film of Davis Guggenheim and Al Gore, An Inconvenient Truth, which you probably all, all have seen or, or heard about. Uh, but that uh, film made a stir in the world of the big corporations. All the oil industry, all the aluminium smelters, all the, all the Alcoas of the world started to tremble. And what did they do? They started to make documentaries about global warming, but from an opposite side. But when uh, the director of NASA saw the film that Al Gore uh, and Guggenheim did, he said, Al Gore may have done for global warming what Silent Spring did for pesticides. He will be attacked, and this was said uh, almost immediately after the film was presented, but the public will have the information needed to distinguish our long-term well-being from short-term special interest. And this is one of the main subjects, the core of making uh, honest documentaries. Uh, and Al Gore and Guggenheim, they were attacked. Along came, for instance, Martin Durkin. I don't know if you know this film, The Great Global Warming Swindle. It, you can reach it at YouTube and you can, you can see it there uh, from beginning to end. And uh, that is a really aggressive answer or, or uh, yeah, uh, contradiction to everything that an inconvenient truth was. And my heart begins to pound because the debate, the war is going on in front of us on all our, on the screens, in the movie theatres and uh, the, the movie makers are debating. Some of them are saying green, others are saying red, left, green, right, you know, and everything is being so confused. And nobody that is really following this, this debate knows today what is true and what is false. And I think that's a really serious matter. And other example, because uh, I come from Iceland and we write a lot of books, uh, this was also a debatable book that was written, The Skeptical env uh, Environmentalist, Measuring the Real State of the World. It's a Danish guy, Björn Lomborg. Uh, he has been debating against uh, the, 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 this issue, the hot issue of uh, the warming of the planet. And then we come to propaganda. We have propaganda on both sides. But propaganda is sometimes disguised, and we talk about disinformation, which is quite honest, but it is also called public diplomacy. So sometimes governments go into public diplomacy, which is propaganda, if they have to defend the oil industry, for instance, or the aluminium smelters. And they, uh, they go into strategic communication, which seem to be really positive, but maybe it isn't. So the politics of global warming is a tricky business, and it is going on in your world. And it's a serious debate. It's a serious battle. I just wanted to tell you that we have now a Reykjavik Film Festival, and since I'm here, I'm not looking at all these green movies that are being screened there. These movies are all, these are documentaries uh, on the environment, and uh, they're all made in 2012 or 2013. The Age of Aluminium, Revolution by Rob Stewart, uh, GMO, Oh My God, by Jeremy Seifert, A River Changes Course, 
vanishing point, a fierce green fire, the battle for a living planet. Oh. And Pandora's promise and greedy living, lying bastards. These, uh, like I say, this is a small festival, Re Reykjavik fe film festival. But they, all the same, they have 10 green movies, di uh, documentaries on. So uh, this is what tells me that, uh, that the, the environment and the debate on global warming and the life or, or death of the ecosystems of the world is so vivid and so important for you. And the war is not over. Mother Earth is still under threat. And the truth needs to be told, need to be told. So that's your role. And I'm the viewer, I'll come to the movie theaters, and I'll look at your work, but I will scrutinize it as well. I'm really critical. So thank you, and good luck to all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, stay here with your microphone, please. Because this is the first time that somebody, we gave you half an hour. And you have made you have made your speech in 14 minutes, and it was full of very good uh, reflections. So thank you for that, uh, Holbrun. And uh, I'm here with my microphone. I would like to pass it on to the first one who raises his hand to to say something. And if you don't raise your hand, I will go and give you the microphone. So you better just come on. Okay, I will start with you, Grigori. As you are also involved in the film festival, and you know about Russian film festivals, and I think it's very, very interesting what Kolbrun is saying about the green documentaries. Is that also a trend in Russia? If, if, maybe it's a stupid word, but are there many green documentary sections in film festivals in this country? Does it play a role? And do you think, from your point of view, that it changes anything? Uh, last question first. Uh, it does. It does change quite a lot of things. But, uh, unfortunately, I wouldn't say that uh, a lot of green documentaries are being produced in Russia. Uh, I would say much less that there should be. Uh, same about festivals. Uh, a couple of festivals which were devoted solely to uh, environment, uh, as far as I understand, has folded down. Uh, the larger festivals are being driven by the uh, general interest, so they may include uh, in environmental films, and they do include environmental films, but they are not uh, motivated in their decisions by the uh, environmental issues. And, uh, well, but the situation is very volatile and very fluid, so uh, things which look not so promising Right now, may start looking that <laughs> in two weeks. Thanks. But in your work as an environmentalist and sitting in commissions and looking at things, has it changed anything, these, some of these films? Have, has it raised the debate among your committees and so on? And has it given you inspiration to, to go and change something? Absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, there has been a lot of education going on in the documentaries that we have seen. We know now much more about reservoirs for huge water power plants. Reservoirs, they do not emit greenhouse gases, but they destroy flora and fauna and wildlife and they uh, make it much more difficult for Iceland, for instance, to bring tourists to the highlands if it is all covered with uh, huge reservoirs and dams and, and, uh, and lines and all that. I would also like to say that uh, the education that, uh, that the people on the outside get from the documentaries is, uh, uh, gives us a deeper insight into, let's say, India 
because when you mine for the bauxite, you have to go into indigenous communities and you have to cut the top of, 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 of mountains to make to get the bauxite. And when you start to produce the bauxite, you, there comes this red mud uh, and you cannot get rid of it. And it's totally polluted. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, what is it called? Gift for Dansk. It's poison. It's poisonous. So these things I know and my colleagues, because we have been watching documentaries. When we were preparing our little speech here, your little speech, you also told me something about some complications in getting access to film in Russia. Would you like to raise that question here as well? One of the things that the environmentalists are worried about is this fact that uh, the ice in the Arctic is melting and uh, the possibilities for uh, big ships to sail the northern route is opening up and the environmentalists uh, are saying oops oops please please, please don't be hurt, don't hurry don't do this <laughs> because this ha it has a lot of dangers involved and uh, documentaries are being made on this issue and people are trying to get to Russia, trying to get into the areas that uh, this is that they are concerned about, the, the wildlife of Siberia and the, the tundra and all these these things, and it's extremely complicated to get in, to get to film in these areas. Uh, we hear about submarines that uh, have been discarded and are now deteriorating in the north, in the Arctic, somewhere far north in Russia, but nobody gets to film it. So th there, is a, there is something that we are afraid about there, and we, we need the, these stories, the stories about the Arctic and the, the dangers that lurk in the Arctic if all this uh, is happening, if the routes are being opened to ships and to military. Uh, we need to have these stories told. We hear about a military base, uh, a Russian military base that was recently opened somewhere far north in Russia, and uh, it hasn't been used since the Cold War. But now they're preparing, everybody is preparing. For what? For sailing of huge ships with oil maybe, or drilling for oil in the, in the Arctic? So there's a lot of stories that need to be told and questions are asked already and the pressure is on you. There's, there's a gentleman who wants to say something. He's speaking in Russian. It's Channel 1. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Mm -hmm. My name is Evgeny Zaharov. I am from St. Petersburg. I produce and I direct documentary films. I wanted to add about the um, ecological documentaries. We started this year new festival in Kronstadt that's called the uh, uh, Cinema on Sales. The next, next year is the year of Gulf of Finland. So we invite all the documentary filmmakers who make films dedicated to environment. I am in charge of selection of the documentaries and I would be very happy if Scandinavian films would come to our festival. I will give you all my information, all the information about the festival. That was the first thing that I wanted to say. I really liked your questions um, about where the money is coming from, who demands the films. And I wanted to give you an example. We, close to the Gulf of Finland, are building a new port. It is a huge investment project. And then they're saying it's going to be a very green port. And then there was demand to make a film dedicated to that port. But when I really studied the topic, I understood that this is just a promotional action. So close the eyes on the problems. And so we said, no, we're not going to make. But I know somebody's making the film. And I'm sure that it will be released. So, you know, they'll have these advantages of 
this green port and they're doing so great. They're sa saving the Gulf of Finland. You know, they're saving the fish. So this fight um, between the mega corporations against the environment and then using their creative powers to illustrate how great we are. It happens, unfortunately, every day, especially here in Russia. So we, in order to try to find independent, um, freely thinking artists that could spend their own money and create some independent films with a very new, fresh look, it's very difficult. Because, you know, in general, we don't have enough money for documentaries. And thinking about this green, you know, it's not a green piece that tried to, to fight the platform. I, I will finish soon, don't worry. It was very interesting for me how was the reaction of official mass media who were saying yesterday, oh, Greenpeace is great, Greenpeace is great organization who is fighting for the rights, for defending the environment, and now who is representing them, the pirates, only those who protect the interests of the other corporations. That's what's happening in Russia, at least. So thank you very much. I would really like to study the films about the environment that are being made about the environment, and especially from the point of view who is giving the money, how objective is the view. And I would like to show those films to our viewers because the water um, makes our countries close. So it's very interesting for the Russian audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please say your name. Hello. My name is Galina Mikhailova. I am a film director. I present the scientific cinematographic films. For the third year in a row, we've had the Festival of Ecological Films. It's Russian film. There are no international um, participants because we have a very big country. So we wanted to connect the regions of Russia and to see what they're doing. Because films that are made in the regions usually do not reach Moscow, do not reach central television. So we don't know about a lot of the problems. There, there are a lot of films that are being made. That's what we discovered. And then I want to say that nobody supports our festival. It's just very enthusiastic. So we technically do not have financement, financing. But it's not important now. The last festival, we had 80 films, 8 zero. I'm not talking about the quality. Usually people just have almost no money, so it's their enthusiasm, so they just make the films. But the spectrum of the problems that is being raised, amazing, huge. So we learn a lot, a lot, and it's very important. So our task is not only to have the festival, but also to bring these films to the audience. Because if we see the movies in the festival, it's not enough. We make programs, we make arrangements with the regions, so local enthusiasts there make these movies available for the people. So this is the work that's being done. And I have a question. The question about financing is like nobody knows where the finances are coming from. I think it's just pure enthusiasm. That's what's happening in our festival. So I'm just I just wanted to say that's what's happening. Just just as a comment. And thank you very much. Thank you for this information. I think that, that the two speakers from Russia, please give pass the information to Mikhail or to uh, Ove from EDN, and they will put you on the list and help you promote your activities. Are there anyone else who wants to say something? Maybe our two computer, behind computer screen activists crowdfunding, uh, transmedia. I mean, do you have just one, Annika, or do you have one good example of transmedia in, in connection with the green films? Now I will walk very slowly down to you so you have time to, to think a little. Over. Very proud of you. Well, I think what, I don't know if you can necessarily call it transmedia, but I think what they did with the Age of Stupid a couple of years ago was, was very, very clever. But I think, however, we also have to, to see 
uh, and understand that the need and, and the expression of the environmental film has to change a little bit because I think what they did with The Age of Stupid and, and getting that film out was great. But still, there was a film that raised awareness. And I think we are now in a situation where there's been so many films raising the awareness that we also now need as filmmakers to look into answers. And I think it's not always enough just to raise awareness. I think we also have to come up with alternatives and look into giving the audience possibilities to react and not only raise an issue. And I think that's where the environmental film is now, as, as I see it at least. That we have had so many films raising awareness that we also need to look into possibilities. I just want to add to that. Uh, I think we in, we in the West are very good at pointing out what's wrong in our place. Um, that uh, just this idea of a whole transmedia campaign. A friend of mine, he's a video director for Greenpeace, and he kind of shocked me when he said that sometimes he finances a documentary that will be seen by only five people and will go nowhere else. And I said, how can you do that? That's crazy. He said, no, if the right five people see the film, we will have a change. We don't need half a planet to know. We just need the right five people. So I think it's also about that when you're making an environmental product. Like, who are your targets? and who can make the real change and how do you get to those people because then it's worth it so. and I'm walking down here to give the microphone to Mr. Vekalati from Finland actually I was asking the microphone just to make two at the walk you know, after yesterday, vodka. No, I totally agree what Uwe was saying, that like the whole strategy of the so-called environmental films is changing and has changed. Instead of that, that creating the fear or even the depression, what is the future of the planet? Today the films are trying to find discussions of the different solutions, real solutions. And uh, that has led even to look at what the technology is offering, or even is there any change in those old enemies, meaning the companies or so-called rich people, like Berti Veijalainen here, he produced a, a new film that I think is really, really different and challenging. It will be also at ITFA main comp uh, the competition, and that's about the billionaire who wants to save the world building the biggest building in the world, the fastest time ever, most environmental building. So there is different kind of new ideas instead of, how to say, repeating the old information. Transmedia side, John Webster, that you know quite well, who make the recipes of disaster, his new film called... Uh, uh, little yellow boots uh, dealing with the uh, uh, climate change that they have a plan to have a quite a big transmedia content in, in connected to the film. Thank you. Two important films have been mentioned, The Age of Stupid and Recipes for Disaster and new films coming up and over wants a microphone again. Well, there's one other example of, I think, a really great environmental film that really made an impact, and it's called Taste the Waste. It's a German production that's really actually a, a strong transmedia project. It started around the movement in Germany uh, where you are, they are actually looking into recycling uh, food and the amount of food that is wasted. And it's, it's a classical transmedia project in the sense that they have a cinema film, an activist film that reads out to a lot of people in the, in the, in the cinema. And then they have a lot of, of um, really concrete ways where you can change your everyday life uh, on the website and through their different transmedia uh, components. So I think if you really want to wanna see, I think, what you could call the second breed of environmental films, environmental films that really go into concrete suggestions of how to change your everyday life, check out Taste the Waste. I mean, it's, it's a very beautiful example. Can I Taste the Waste. Yeah, please. Can I say something? Uh, I think... Uh, you're quite right, Uwe, that uh, the new way of telling stories 
is probably going to help us find the right answers and find the truth concerning uh, the environment. Uh, what Ike was saying about uh, the progress or, or, or the new, uh, the, the, I mean, there are being made films now and they seem to be really authentic with scientific information talking about the IPCC, IPCC and the global warming things and it, uh, they, they do it from scientific points of view and they look as if they are telling the truth but they are contradicting everything that the environmentalists are saying and that is what I, I think, I mean, it's a, so difficult for the normal viewer. Uh, everybody uh, uh, claims to be telling the truth, but there are, so, so the truths are so different from one film to another. So a transmedia way of telling the story uh, makes it possible for the viewers to ask the questions, for the viewers to be active, to be, to be par take part in, in searching for the right answers. So I'm really excited for the new ways of telling stories through transmedia, and I think that's going to be positive for the environmental films. Thank you very much for bringing this up and being so time-wise, time time-conscious, so we had a lot of input here. Bravo, thank you.